good to be with everybody again this evening, and uh, I appreciate the warm welcome we've received thus far. Uh, as I've talked about a little bit, there's a book back there on the book stand uh, called Substantive Faith. And the reason that this book has ever come about is because of a number of reasons. But there's one that also was behind it, and that is that we have these gospel meetings, and uh, I have found that our numbers from the community are dropping off. It's a lot of people who are already Christians. Uh, do we have anybody who is not affiliated with the Churches of Christ here this evening? Okay, so that, that's kind of to my point. Um, here's what the purpose of this kind of meeting is about then. You've got people that you run into at work, don't you? You've got people that you meet at the store. You've got friends and family members. You've got children or perhaps grandchildren. And the answer that we're seeking to give is to the question as to why we believe what we believe. If we're going to make converts to Christ, it's going to have to come with convincing and providing of reasons. And so people are asking these questions still. It doesn't take much to look around our world and see that there is still a real serious need for the gospel. But people need to have something concrete as to why they believe what they believe. If we're going to convince people on Christianity, it's going to have to be based on evidence. And so we have that in the New Testament. I quoted a couple of those passages uh, just yesterday. And so the reason that we're giving apologetic material is in hopes that we might be persuasive in bringing about the gospel in the same way that the apostles were doing in the first century. The, up to this point, what we've talked about is, does God exist? And of course, if you're a Christian, you already are committed to that view. Then we raise the question as to whether or not miracles occurred. And if you're a Christian, you're already committed to that view. But we've started to provide argumentation as to why we believe in these sorts of things. And then last night, we went down a different kind of path, but a necessary one, as we talked about whether or not, whether or not the transmission of the text has been reliable. And we concluded last night that at least, at the least, what's been handed down to us from people like Matthew and Paul and Peter, we've reached the conclusion that what was handed down truly was faithful to what they wrote. The question we're seeking to answer tonight is whether or not what they wrote is factual, whether or not it is true, whether or not it is accurate. You see, Matthew, we could have Matthew's actual words that he left behind for us to have, but it could be the case that Matthew's propositions, the statements that he makes within, are actually false. And the question we seek to answer then tonight is whether or not the statements that he did make and we now have retained, whether or not they are true. So this evening, I've got six observations that I'll bring before us as to why I'm convinced that the New Testament and the words that it makes as a claim are true and faithful, not just in the transmission that we've received, but also in the content and what they profess to be the truth. So, are they historical claims? Yes. Are they philosophical claims? Yes. In some cases, they may even be scientific or archaeological claims. But in the case that the New Testament specifically makes a claim, if it's by inspiration, I'm convinced, and Lord willing, you are as well, that these statements are true. You've got a worksheet with you. If there's anything that I bypass in detail, shoot me an email, ask me at the door, something like that, or get the book, and you might uh, develop some of that further. There's a little more material in there than is what, on, what is in the presentation this evening. Our first observation we need to make is this. The Bible claims reliability. And that is very interesting because there are ancient documents, there are documents within secular history that are written, and they are mythological. They are legendary. They are fictitious, and they don't purport to be anything but that. So it's very interesting if you were to pick up a copy of some kind of pagan text, something that's not anywhere close to monotheism as found in the Bible, these texts you might start to read and find, well, they don't even claim to be legitimate human history. That, when set over against the Bible, is remarkably different. The text that we have before us claims to be containing of events that have happened within the past human history. And this compels us to believe in Christ and to believe in him as the risen Lord. We'll talk more about that tomorrow night, and this is where our whole study is working towards. Tomorrow night we'll talk about the resurrection. Did it happen? Wednesday night we'll say, if the resurrection did happen, what did it mean? You see, what we've been building to is that there is a faith, Christianity, 
There is substance behind it. We've been working forward with the evidence. The final night of our series, we will conclude, if all of this is true, now what does it mean? And what does it mean for people like you and me in the year 2022, 2,000 years later from Christ? The first thing we need to observe about the Bible's claim to be reliable is this. There were eyewitnesses. Take a look at John 21 and verse 24 with me. John's gospel comes to a close and he is the only one that we can say for certain, at least the text of John's gospel claims this to be the case, that he was an eyewitness to the events that happened surrounding the person, Jesus of Nazareth. In John chapter 21 and verse 24, it says, This is the disciple who is testifying to these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. It's another matter as to why he writes about himself in the third person, that he does is perfectly suitable to us. In verse 25, John 21, 25, he goes on and says, and there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. John has to only give us a snapshot, a summary of the things surrounding the person, Jesus of Nazareth, and he claims to be an eyewitness to these events. This leads us to a second point, a second sub-point, and that is that there were contemporary witnesses. There were contemporary witnesses. So not only do we have John as an eyewitness, Peter J. Williams, a brilliant mind out of Cambridge over in the United Kingdom, makes a marvelous argument that Matthew is also an eyewitness. And would we think otherwise as Bible believers? Of course not. Matthew is one of the 12 apostles and therefore would also be an eyewitness and walked with Jesus according to Matthew 10 and some of the other accounts. As we take a look at our second point here, we have contemporary witnesses. And that is the point we were making last night. I want to look at this very quickly and then I've got to move off of it. But this is Luke 1. We read this last night. This is Luke chapter 1, beginning in verses 2 and 3. I don't have time to read verse 1 again. But Luke starts his gospel out and he says that the things that he's writing in his gospel account are things that were handed down to him who from the beginning they were eyewitnesses, so people like John or perhaps Matthew, and then a second element, the servants of the word. So not necessarily eyewitnesses, but people who were contemporary witnesses and passed down the same kind of testimony and the same kind of tradition to the next generation of saints. Take a look at this then in Acts chapter 1 and verse 1. The text, as it claims, is claiming to be human history. This is remarkable. This is not mythological. This is not legendary. This is nothing like you would read in some kind of fictitious novel. This text, written in a time around the events, the contemporary events surrounding the person of Jesus of Nazareth, we have the same kind of writers in that time frame claiming that this stuff was legitimate human history. In fact, Luke's second text, the books of Luke and Acts, used to be together in one manuscript. They used to be conjoined. But because John's gospel was penned, the people who arranged our English texts felt the need to put John in the in-between, and they separated Luke and Acts from being one text. This is interesting to me. Why? Because Luke moves right out of his first gospel, his first text, into this second section, the book of Acts. And look at how he starts it off in Acts 1.1. Does this strike you as mythological or legendary or propagandist? I don't think so. In Acts 1.1 it says, the first account, speaking of Luke, I composed Theophilus, same individual that's the recipient of Acts as in Luke 1. And he says it was about all Acts 1.1 that Jesus began to do and to teach. Now, think about this for just a moment with me. The books of Luke and Acts are written in events. They are written in the events that are contemporary to Jesus of Nazareth. If these records are fudged in any way, if they are falsified in any way, the readers would immediately throw up a red flag and say, that is not how this happened. But in fact, Acts and Luke both, and then John's Gospel and the others, are so early, as we pointed out last night, that the contemporaries if they were false, would have said, this is not right. This is not how it happened. But the fact that Luke and Paul and the others are saying, check us out on this, speaks to the authenticity, not only of the transmission, but also to the contents that are found within. 
And so in Acts chapter 1, we have records of what Jesus began to both do and teach. If they didn't happen this way, and the record is falsified, the contemporaries would call all of this into question. Flip over the page and look at Acts 2.22 then. And look at this sermon that Peter gives on the first Pentecost day following the resurrection of our Lord. He says in 2.22 of Acts, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed in the midst of you, just as you yourselves know, this man having been delivered over, la la la, God raised him again, 2.24. The point I'm making from 2.22 is that he did and taught these things in the midst of the people. This was, as Paul would later say in the book of Acts in his defense before Agrippa in Acts chapter 26, this was not a thing done in a corner. The resurrection was out in the open and the people of that day were so convinced by it that we will see as tonight and then tomorrow night that they were so convinced that they would suffer and die for the teaching and preaching of it. Now we've made that argument a number of times already. This compels us to believe that the gospel is truly what they were saying. Let's move forward then and make a third point under this, and that is the apostolic testimony. If you flip over a few more pages in the book of Acts to chapter 5, this is not too long after Peter and John particularly have been cast into prison a number of times. In fact, the first time was in Acts chapter 4, that they are beaten by the Sanhedrin and told, do not speak anymore in his name. In Acts chapter 5, they find themselves back in the temple by the miraculous intervention of the angel as the text develops. And it says in Acts chapter 5 and verse 40, once again, they've been beaten and told not to preach the resurrection in Christ's name. This is Acts chapter 5 and verse 40. Read with me. It says, they took his advice. This is Gamaliel, a fellow among the Sanhedrin council. And after calling the apostles in, they flogged them. And it says that they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and then released them. So they went on their way, 41, from the presence of the council, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the risen Christ. This is very interesting to me. Why, and we've asked this question a number of times already, why would they suffer and die for a testimony that's not true? Was it a hallucination? Odd that all 12 of the apostles would have the same hallucination. Was it fraudulent? And they all conspired together to preach and teach this lie that Jesus had risen from the grave. If so, why suffer and die for something that's such a lie? This doesn't make sense. The first thing we recognize about our New Testament is that the claim is that this purports to be legitimate human history. The second observation we might make is that the Bible is verifiable. This is the point we've been making with the contemporary history. Let's make it just a little bit more to solidify the argument. This is 1 Corinthians 11. We've read 1 Corinthians 15, and I might make a passing remark about it again this evening here in just a moment, but let's stop off before we turn there at 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 23. You might know the events that happened just before the eve of Christ's crucifixion. The sun went down. They gathered in the upper room. The meal was had. And at a certain, tar, a certain part of the, the supper, Christ set aside this unleavened bread and this fruit of the vine. And he said, by the way, the one of you who's sitting here at dinner who dips the bread into the cup there, the sop, he says, uh, he's the one that will betray me. Judas was the one who did it. And then, of course, all of this breaks loose. Well, on the night of his crucifixion, he establishes something like the Lord's Supper and says this bread symbolizes my body. Take, eat, remember me. He takes the fruit of the vine and says this also represents my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. This is the blood of the new covenant. Do it in remembrance of me. As we look at 1 Corinthians 11, we have Paul reminiscing on this setup this memorial, the Lord's Supper. And it's something that we as Christians do every Lord's Day, every first day of the week. And the reason for that, there are numerous reasons, but the one that we're calling attention to here is in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-three, 23, and that is that it predated 
the events of the Lord's Supper predated the Apostle Paul. This was not some late fiction that came about far later. Maybe Paul was right and he treated it as something that was far earlier. Look at it with me, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three. He says, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And he goes on to establish more or less what I just recounted to you. What do you think, what do you make out of that word received in 1123? He says he received it. In order to receive something, it had to be in existence before, don't you think? He's saying that this wasn't some late fiction that came about in the year 200 A.D., 500 A.D. This isn't some late fictitious story, you see. Paul, in the year, I, I said this yesterday, the book of 1 Corinthians was written somewhere around A.D. 56. All of the scholars, liberals, all of the critics, they all agree. 56 A.D. about is the year of this writing. Paul says he received the Lord's Supper tradition earlier. You know what that says about the testimony of the Bible? It was verifiable. You could check it with the people who were living before Paul. Is that true, Paul? Did the Lord's Supper exist before you came to Corinth? And they'd all say, yes, that's how it happened. You could verify it with the contemporaries. And the texts, therefore, as we pointed out last night, are also early. This is not some late fiction that arose just in yesteryear. Take a look at 1 Corinthians 15 now, and we'll make a passing remark. Let's see if we can't make an analogy while we're flipping over there that we might well be acquainted with. Could you imagine somebody telling you an event that only happened just around 20 years ago, the Twin Towers didn't fall? Could you be convinced of that? Now, I don't think a one of us here could be convinced that the Twin Towers over in New York are still standing, do you? Why not? What would you do to disprove a fellow that said, no, they are still standing? Well, the first thing you might do is say, well, let's go see. And you could check in New York and you could see whether or not that's the case. But the second thing you might do, especially to save yourself the gas money that you'd have to spend in 2022, bad joke, okay. Uh, you might check and see with the people who were there in the year that it happened. You might ask, did the Twin Towers fall or not? Now, let's say this. Let's say that they say, well, they're not standing, but they fell by earthquake rather than by planes. Now we've got another thing we could do. Let's ask the people that were there, did you see this? You see, what we're going to do now is we're going to verify with the people. Now, of course, since the year that that happened, some of them had died. Don't you think that some of the people who maybe had watched the planes crash into the tower have died? I think so. But some of them might still be alive, and we could ask those that remain. That is precisely Paul's argument when it comes to the resurrection of Jesus. Look at this in 1 Corinthians 15. We did a little bit of this last night. It says in verse 4, he was buried, he was raised, and I'll call attention to this here in just a moment. All of that happened, as it says, verse 4, according to the scriptures. If you think about the scriptures that Paul has access to, they're not New Testament texts. They are Old Testament texts. And I'll point that out here in just a moment. But Paul says something like this. He says he appeared to Cephas, the 12, the 500, and then he says, oh, now most of them still do live. They still remain, but some have died. And so he says in verse 7, he also appeared to James and also then one to untimely born, me, the apostle Paul, out of due season. Verse 8. What's Paul's argument? If you're wanting to know about whether or not the events of the New Testament are factual, ask the people who were there. He is begging. Luke is begging. John, an eyewitness, is begging. Matthew's gospel, a probable eyewitness to the events, is begging. All of these texts are begging us to look back into antiquity to see, is, it how that, is that how that happened or not? The Bible, because of its earliness, is telling us that not only are they early and therefore verifiable, they're also contemporary with the people that we could check that with. And then, as I pointed out last night, I just got to make this point in passing, we contrast that with other religions. It is interesting to me that if you talk to somebody of the Mormon faith, it's very interesting to me, they've got a whole backstory that's behind their religion, and you can't find a witness, you can't find a source that goes back to when those events allegedly happened. 
You know what they tell us about the, the golden plates? They tell us, oh, you need to read the golden plates. The ironic thing about that is those didn't surface until 1800. I suppose it's easy for us to take what could be a, a thing right now and start writing up a fake history. If there's nobody to verify it with, it's nearly useless, wouldn't you say? The Bible's not like that. The texts that we're looking at when it comes to our Bibles are not texts that were written yesterday. They're texts that go back to the years 200, 300, 400 A.D., even in the era where there were people who were contemporary and early that could have been verified. So, number three then, the Bible has unity. As we think about another argument then for why we believe that the content within the Bible is factual, it's not only because of its eyewitnesses, or its claims. It's not only because of the contemporary history and because of how early it is, but it's also because it has an, a remarkable and extreme unity about it. And I'll break this down into three subcategories. The first one is it has remarkable unity in that there were about how many authors of the Bible, human authors that is? About 40. Maybe you learned that in Sunday school. I remember learning that about age two or three. My mama had these little cards, and one of them was, how many men wrote the Bible? About 40. About 40 men. That's about right. That's about right. Why is that remarkable? Folks, do you think that we could take 40 people from our audience this evening, set them uh, into different rooms, and say, now all of y'all write what you think is a truth about Christianity, just from your own understanding. Do you think that we might cross over each other at times? I think so. What other document has been worked on by so many hands and has come out having such unity? I mean, you might be able to think of a few, but the fact that about 40 different men, not from one year, not talking about the same event, but from how much history? The entire world, and they all harmonize with each other? Then we take a particular look at the Gospels, and let me make an assertion here. This brings us to our next point, and that is that we find there are no contradictions. There are no contradictions. Now, some would challenge me on this. In fact, that is the dominant view on our university campuses, our college campuses today, and sadly it's creeping into some high schools. Our children are hearing that the Bible is just simply full of contradictions. Well, I wonder how that jives with our view of the Christian faith. If the Bible's full of errors, it's only but a step before our children give up on the Bible as the Holy Bible, a text, a communication from God, don't you think? After all, if it's so contradictory, why put any faith in something that just crosses over itself? Well, let's think for just a moment about what it would take to establish a legitimate contradiction. First and foremost, let me raise this one. It would have to be where there is no set of circumstances that both statements could be true. I might tell you that I am a guitar player. I might tell you that I'm a preacher. And you might say, well, those are contradictory statements. They are not. They are contrary statements. But could both propositions be true at the same time? You and I both know that, right? So the first thing would be it has to be a set of circumstances where there can be no possible explanation. The second thing that we might observe is that the differences, um, the parallels, if they are parallels where they're crossing over each other, would need to be actual. Let me give you a case of that. Have you heard of the account of Jesus feeding the 5,000? Yes. Have you heard of the account where Jesus fed the 4,000? You say, I've heard of that one too. Are those contradictory? Well, no, no. There may be multiple events, don't you think? There could be multiple events. We've got another possibility, and that is that the perspectives could be different. I actually heard of this case one time in a newspaper. There was a car that, com well, the car didn't commit the robbery. You see, the fellow driving the car committed the robbery. He got into a car, and they had spray-painted one side of it black and the other side white so that they could get away and there would be conflicting reports about the vehicle. I mean, these are possibilities. This may not be the normal way of things, but these are possible explanations. And then there are literary conventions. There's this text in 2 Samuel that I was looking at the other day, and it talks about how David was the equivalent of 10,000 men. How many of you think that David was literally equivalent to 10,000 men? That's not the point that the author's making. Literary conventions such as hyperbole, or we might exaggerate, we might say there were 1,000 turkeys up on that hill. Do we intend that literally or not? It is extremely difficult. The point I'm making is that it is extremely difficult to have a contradiction. 
the circumstances must be such where there can be no possible explanation. The people that are saying that the Bible contradicts itself simply aren't investigating the data clearly enough. Let me give you one that is still, for whatever reason, I do not know. But let me show you one that is, po that is the most uh, popular among the critics. Take a look at Matthew 27 with me for just a moment. This is Matthew chapter 27. Following the death of our Lord, or at least during the time of the death of our Lord, Judas comes to the chief priests and the elders of the Jewish nation. And it says in 27 and verse 3, he had betrayed him. And in Matthew 27, 3, he had been condemned, Jesus had. Judas, it says in 27, 3 of Matthew, felt remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. Priests and elders. And he said, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, what is that to us? See to yourself. And following such, he threw the pieces of silver, verse 5, into the temple sanctuary and departed and went away and hanged himself. The way, according to Matthew's gospel, that Judas dies is by hanging. You might hold your finger there for a brief moment and flip over to Acts chapter 1. Hold your finger at Matthew 27 and flip over to Acts chapter 1. I do not know why this is the most popular quote-unquote contradiction that the skeptics can apparently find. But in Acts chapter 1, it says this in Acts chapter 1 and verse 16. The scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit foretold by the mouth of David concerning Judas. And it says he became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. This is Acts 1.17. He was counted among us, the apostles, and received his share in this ministry. Now this man, Judas, verse 18, acquired a field with the price of his wickedness, and falling headlong he burst open in the middle, and all his intestines gushed out. And it became known to all who were living in Jerusalem, so that in their own language that field was called Akeldama, that is, the field of blood. The usual suggestion by the critics is that this is what's happened. Matthew says he died by hanging. Luke says that he died by his bowels gushing out. Are you sure that those are contradictory? I'm not so sure. What's to say? I mean, at least we can come up with a possible set of circumstances in which both cases are true. We might ask of Matthew's account, did he hang himself? If so, it's highly possible, in fact, Acts is telling us that it's probable, that after a time, his body falls from the noose, perhaps. He falls forward. His bowels gush out. But nowhere in the Acts text you might have recognized does it say that he died by his guts falling out. It's highly possible that both texts are credible. From a historical angle, we might ask of this then, if we're to doubt Matthew or if we're to doubt Acts, which one should we doubt and why? As responsible historical readers, we would be forced to read Matthew and Acts, and if we can at least come up with a scenario where both sets, uh, sets of circumstances are possible, we might give secular testimony the benefit of the doubt. It's striking to hear the critics level this kind of thing against the Bible, but it's also striking to hear them give benefits of the doubt to people like Livy and Plutarch and Pliny and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Number three under this as a subpoint, the Bible's unity is remarkable in that it has a canonical whole to it. You might be a, a big reader of novels and there might be a series that's your favorite. And it really gets dicey sometimes if the author of the series changes. But usually if it's a single author, and it's a whole series written by that same author, it has a good flow to it, and the writer knows how to keep the story going, and it doesn't cross over itself all the time. Interestingly enough, those 40 writers of the, our Bible, the fact that they don't cross over each other, like I pointed out in 3a, speaks something about their unity in that regard. But there's another element, and that is that the entire New Testament connects to the Old, and there's this thread that consistently runs through it starts back in Genesis with the seed project in Genesis chapter 3 as the serpent, Satan, betrays Adam and Eve and lies to them. And from that point forward, the whole world falls under a curse. It's not long after that that Abraham comes onto the scene, Genesis 12. And it's through his line that we run into this long-lost heir, Judah, who is the fourth son of Jacob, who is the son of Isaac, who is the son of Abraham. Speaking of Judah, this fourth boy that belongs to Jacob, 
it said of Judah, the scepter will not depart until Shiloh come. Speaking of this idea of a messianic hope. Years down the road, it's Judah's line who gives birth to none other than Boaz. And Boaz brings to us Obed. And a few generations skip down, and we run into this character named Jesse. And then Jesse brings us to this fellow named David, his eighth son. So says 1 Samuel 16. And David, this heir of Judah, all the way back from Genesis, is said to have a descendant that will yet come and will be Savior, Messiah, King of the world. In Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1, we open up our New Testament. And the entire New Testament then connects itself back to the old as it says that Jesus was an heir, not just of Abraham, but also of David. Is this coincidence? Folks, I don't have time to read to you all of these texts that are on the PowerPoint, so I just won't bore you with them enough. But these texts need to be read. Jesus Christ was an heir of David. He was declared such by the resurrection, so says Romans 1.4. And it was with the resurrection that he established himself not only as David's heir, but also David's Lord. Therefore, quoting Psalm 110 where he said, The Lord, Jehovah God, said to my Lord, the Christ, the second member of the Godhead, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Jesus uses that text in Matthew 22 to say that he is David's heir and that he is the one that had been prophesied, not just back in some yesteryear, but all the way back even to Genesis 49, the earliest text that we have in our Bibles. This thread runs all the way through. Could this have been done by mere human intervention? No. It speaks about the divine mind that lies behind the text. The Bible has a remarkable unity and cannot just be easily dismissed. Number four, the Bible's explanation is fitting and simple. The Bible's explanation for these events is fitting and simple. Here's the point I seek to make. The writers, if you read through, let's say, Matthew or Acts, the writers pay very close attention to detail. In fact, Luke's book has names all over it, names and dates. He lets you know he's in Palestine. He lets you know when he's with Paul and they're over in Macedonia. Luke is precise, and we would expect nothing more uh, being a doctor. I suppose the only thing about Luke that really does shock us is that his text was legible. Okay, uh, the Bible's explanation for this stuff is fitting and simple. It makes sense. If they paid extreme attention to detail in the small things like geography, topography, names, animals, and they do, what do you think they did about the big events? You think they made up the resurrection? Again, the contemporary people would have called their hand on that and said, that's not how that happened. Point number, f uh, well, let's just bypass that. We're running low on time, I think. Number five, the Bible's explanation is expected. It is expected. Humor me for a, a moment. I did this yesterday. Humor me for a moment. If Christ really is God in the flesh, how many of you think that such a being, if he did exist, could actually work miracles? That's sensible, I suppose, given the hypothetical. Humor me for another moment. Imagine that Jesus really was God in the flesh. How many of us would expect him to be an historical personage? Yeah, I suppose that'd be fitting. Number uh, letter B, 5B. How many of us would expect his claims and his actions to be that of God in the flesh? Well, if he really is, what would you expect? Changing water to wine isn't really out of his character then. His claim in John 5:18 to be equal to God isn't really that far of a stretch if he really is God in the flesh. Him saying that he was the pre-incarnate word, John 1.14, and he was made flesh and dwelt among us, isn't that far out of reality if he really is God? Don't you think? So the biblical's explanation is not only fitting in simple, point four, but point five, it is expected. This is precisely what we'd expect if he truly were God in the flesh. Now let her see then, 5C, Jesus meets our needs. Think about your own personal experience for a moment. And look Christianity in the face and ask of it, what do I get from New Testament Christianity? Tonight is a Monday night. It's roughly 7.30. Some of you probably feel like it's 7.50. Uh, 
Why are you here? What do you expect from New Testament Christianity? What does it meet that might be one of your needs? Look, folks, whether we like it or not, there is something within us that requires spirituality. The people who are not Christians, they have religions too. There's the element of rationality, where Jesus meets our intellectual need for stimulation. And he tells us, he gives us a book, 66 books, that come together to speak to us. God speaks to us from his heart to our hearts. What else is met? It gives us purpose in life. It tells us there's a reason for our existence here. It tells us about the universal need. It doesn't matter if you're a black person, a white person, if you're a male, if you're a female, if you're a Jew or you're a Gentile. It speaks to all of us. These are the needs that the gospel meets. And it goes beyond that as well. So not only does it cut across class and culture, it speaks to us on a personal level when we deal with evil, pain, and suffering. And then we think about Jesus, this boy from Nazareth, and we think, well, he doesn't know about death. Oh, yes, he does. We think he doesn't know about suffering. He knows about that too. Turn over and get this one with me. This is Hebrews 4, verse 15. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. Some of us might have thought of New Testament Christianity that God doesn't understand us, but there's one thing about Jesus that he really does really get right. He gets all of it right, but he gets this one really right. He knows you and me and he knows what we're going through because he's been there too. It says in 4.15 of Hebrews, we don't have the kind of high priest which can't be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted just like we are, yet without sin. What do you need from New Testament Christianity? Is it purpose in life? Is it love? Is it some kind of family into which you could be adopted? Do you need intellectual stimulation? What is it that you need? The New Testament doctrine, the New Testament faith, Christianity meets us where we are at in this world. Jesus meets our needs. This is what we would expect if there really were a God out there at the distance who cares and loves for us, we would expect him to meet our needs. And this is the kind of person we find in Jesus. I like what one fellow said about Christ. He said this, Jesus is the kind of person you and I would want to spend time with. Jesus is the kind of person we'd want to spend time with. Well, what about you? Are you that kind of person? If not, let the New Testament transform you into that. Last point, number six, our last ob observation, is the Bible beats the alternative. How many of you feel, in light of everything I've just said, how many of you feel that the Genesis 1 through 11 narrative about the creation of the world were some later fiction. Some late fellow just drew all this up fictitiously. Oh, and then there was that little bit, you know, about the crossing of the Red Sea. Some late author, he just wrote that up too. That was all fictitious. And then later on, the whole exile and all that happened there, that may have had some history to it, but a lot of the prophets and all of that, that was just fictitious as well. And then there was this boy, Jesus of Nazareth. So say all of the skeptics pretty much today, they say Jesus did exist, but he didn't really rise from the dead. How many of you feel that he was a real person, but he didn't claim the things he claimed, he didn't do the things he said to do, and he didn't certainly rise from the grave? Certainly wasn't born from a virgin either. How many of you feel like that's fitting, expected, makes sense? Folks, for all of the reasons I've just said, there would be a number of reasons why people would call that into question and say, no, I think this is more than that. This is historical. The contemporaries would reject it. The texts are too early. For a hundred reasons, we can't go that route and say all of this is some late fiction drawn up as a novel. Are there objections to anything I've said? There are. I don't have time to deal with them. But let me read a couple of them to you, and I'll trust that if you're really that interested, you'll get in touch with me. I've got a, a book back there. If you want a free PDF, shoot me an email or something. I'll get you the material. Does the Bible truly record history? For the six reasons I just gave, we have to conclude that it does. The second objection might be, is it not just fictitious or mythological or propagandist? I don't think so. It doesn't claim to be anything of the sort. It certainly looks historical and it was written far too early and in light of the contemporary events for us to think anything other than it. And then you've got the apostles suffering and dying for the thing. And then number three, isn't the Bible full of contradictions? We've dealt with that enough, don't you think? Look, let's draw all this to a conclusion. Why you should believe that the content of the Bible is legitimate there are six reasons I've given. Number one, it claims to be such. Number two, 
it is verifiable. That's the point I've made all evening long. Number three, it sustains a remarkable unity. Number four, its explanation is fitting and simplistic. Number five, its explanation is expected. And number six, it beats the only alternative view that could possibly be suggested, which is that all of this is just some late fraud. Folks, tomorrow night we're going to come back and talk about whether or not Jesus really did rise from the grave. If we take the Bible as secular history, secular literature, we'll establish the case tomorrow night that not only is the rest of the Bible verifiable and its content trustworthy, we'll establish that Jesus really did rise from the grave. And then number six, we'll talk about Wednesday night. What does that mean? Quickly, let me tell you what it means this evening. It means that you can have life with Christ. It means that you can believe in him, the only person who has ever beaten death at its game. You can believe in him, identify with him as the risen Lord, as your moral substitute, and by putting him on in faith, confession, and turning away from a wicked way of life, you too can be baptized in his name, linking yourself to him and walking in newness of life, Romans 6, 1 through 7. This evening, if you've not heard his gospel, believed in him as the risen Lord, repented of a past wicked way of life, confessed his name before men, Romans 10, 9, and 10, and been baptized in his name, you need to become a New Testament child of God. We'll establish this more at length in the following lessons. If you're not a child of God, become one this evening. If you are, but you've heard, you've fallen away and need to come home, whatever needs you might have, won't you come as together we stand and sing.